bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. You love the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Aren't you delighted to be in the house of the Lord and be able to share this beautiful day together? And looking forward to how the Lord's going to help us these next few days. And this time, I believe, to be a very special time where we can truly come back and focus on the things of God. We're living in the last of the last days, church. The last days did not begin when Mr. Obama was reelected, nor when Kim Davis went to jail. Say so, amen. But what we're seeing is the lengthening shadows of the last days. And we're seeing a, a, something coming together, realizing it's not much longer. So we better do all that we can in the few days that we have left, if that. And I believe God has ordained for this week to give us an opportunity to come together, to refocus. There's just so many things that are out there that can distract us and pull our attention away. But to allow us to refocus. Now, now I'm, 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 I'm not a prophet, but let me go ahead and prophesy to you. You ready? I know, if there's ever any charismatic out here, they love that personal prophecy stuff, don't they? Let me prophesy. Are you ready? <clears throat> Wickedness is going to wax worse. All right? So I just, I, just, I just told you about everything that's going to happen in the news for the next few days, all right? It's going to get worse. Politicians are going to tell half-truths. The economy is going to be shaky. All right, now that we got all that out of the way, I just told you everything's going to happen in, in the world for the next few days, all right? So why don't we take those few days and come back to the Lord? Now, you don't have to raise your hand on this. In fact, don't raise your hand. But, but how many of you believe everything you read in the newspaper? Now, don't raise your hand on this one. How many of you believe everything you read in the Word of God? Now, don't raise your hand on this one. <clears throat> how many of you spend more time in the newspaper than the Word of God? I mean, we know that's not true. We, we, we know those things are just far, are farce and foolish and... And then when it comes to the Word of God, we kind of sidestep it when it's absolute truth. Now, I know we're going to have a busy week this week. I know there's going to be things that pop up. But I truly, I desire that your heart, your mind, your attention would take these few days and push everything off to the side and say, Lord, deal with us again. Speak to us again. We don't have to keep up with what's going on down the road. We don't have to keep up with what's going on here and yet. But Lord, just talk to us. Take this time. And talk to us one more time, Father. Church, this may just be the last revival that we're ever in. This could be it. This could be the last one. Amen. Now, there's something else we're able to do today. And this is a very, very fascinating week for me. Because today, I get to come alongside you and speak to your pastor. And throughout the week, I get to come alongside your pastor and speak to you. Now, I knew he would do it. You knew he would do it. We knew he would do it. There was a time this morning, he pulls me off the side. He says, now, now Brother Estes, I, I just want to let you know. I know what today is. I know the, I know the festivities. I know all that. But you don't, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. And I said, Brother Hurst, we don't get to do this very often, you know. So if it'd be okay, I mean, if you, if you think you're, if you think, I mean, there are some people, they just, it's hard for them to go week to week without getting that little pat on the back and, you know, push and nudge and all that. But we're just going to take this morning service and we're going to draw the attention off of us and we're going to put it back on someone else. All right. And I think it'd be good. I think it would be good if we'd give honor to where honor is due. Would you agree? I was thinking as Brother Hoffman was singing that song this morning about the faces that he'll see throughout eternity for the people that we've touched. And I began just to muse. And I said, Lord, Clifford Hurst has not been here for, is it 24 years now? Clifford Hurst has not been here for 24 years because he lacks the intelligence and ability to be somewhere else that would be a lot less stressful and a whole lot more financially helpful in some way. Come on. Thank God for men that are called. And thank God for men that are obedient to that heavenly vision. Thank God they're still men. That opportunity for other things don't pull them away from what God birthed in their heart as a young man. And thank God for a church that's willing to accept and to be led. And to, to allow God to use someone to walk into their lives to help them 
further them in the kingdom of the Lord. Amen. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I know that you do. Turn with me, please, to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 5, verse number 1. 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 1. Now, I want you to be able to stick around after service. I know we've got a meal planned and... You say, well, Brother Estes, I'm, I'm not from this church. Well, two things. If you're not from this church, please don't judge the preaching that normally comes from this pulpit from today's service, okay? This is just, you just, you just brush that off and say this is once, you know, once event thing here. And uh, number two, even if you're not from this church, I think I know these folks good enough to tell you you're invited. We want you here. Believe me, they, these are good people. They'll, they'll, they'll take your idea. Amen. They did me. And of course, now I was kind of tied to it a little different. I'm talking about marrying up, you know, I said, "Yay and amen to that." Thank God. Whew. Amen. First Peter, chapter number five, verse number one: The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also am a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples, literally examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. What a thought. What a thought. Now. I want to speak this morning just on this simple thought. The shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd and the sheep. Oh, wasn't it so well said today? I want to be as good a shepherd or as good a sheep as he has been a shepherd. Are you going to help me preach this morning? If you would, slip your hands to heaven and ask the Lord to have his way in the remainder of this service. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this church. I thank you, God, for 24 years of ministry for a man and his family that's willing to sacrifice and put the Lord first. I thank you for people, God, that's willing to come alongside men and women and support them, God. I thank you, God, for a church that's willing to pray one for another. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done. I thank God for the ministry that's went forward. I thank God for lives that have been changed, God. And I pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven this morning. Inside of this service, in Jesus' name we do pray and everyone said amen. Would you shake two or three people's hand as you're being seated and tell them I'm glad to see you this morning in the house of God. That's it. Talk to them. Amen. I know collectively we as a church honor our pastor today. But I tell you, God, I believe it would be even good if individually sometime throughout the day you just take a moment. It would be good for you to text your pastor, your pastor's wife on an individual basis and just let them know, let them know how much they mean to you. Amen. Peter is addressing the church in 1 Peter chapter number 5. The church was living in dangerous times, much like we're living in dangerous times today. And he reminds them of a character and he, he points them to the way that they should go. Now remember the people there in Peter's day, they knew a lot about raising sheep. So what we see in the word of God is an analogy, an analogy that they can relate to. And the word of God shows them what he shows us today, that God's people are very much like sheep it says in psalms 95 and 7 he is our god and we are the people of his pasture the sheep of his hand now if god's people are like sheep the church is like a flock and if people are like sheep and the church is like a flock then the pasture is likened unto a shepherd friend hear me today there's a chief shepherd and that's jesus christ but under that chief shepherd there are pastors that he's placed in your life and my life that, he may, that they may show us and help us and direct us. I want to remind you something, beloved. The hardest thing for you and I to do is to see ourselves inside of the picture. It takes somebody to come from the outside and to show us things in our life. You know, most of us are real good at letting our own self off the hook. Oh, don't look at me so sanctified. Every one of you that's ever downloaded one of them apps that counts your calories, isn't it amazing how you cheat on the days that you blow it? 
Say amen. You know, you know when you're under, you can't wait to put that thing in and show you in five weeks you'd be this skinny. Come on, say amen. Come on, but we let oh, say, but we let ourselves off the hook so very easy. That's why God is ordained for people to walk inside of our life and through the word of God and through the wisdom of God can show us exactly where we are and to say this is the way of the Lord and this is the way you need to walk. Oh, don't you wish God would have likened us to something just a little better than a sheep? Don't you wish he'd have looked at us and said, Ye are as strong as horses. Ye are as wise as an owl. Ye are as beautiful as a peacock. No, he said, you're just about like a sheep. You know what? You can, I've never seen a sheep in a circus before. You can't train a sheep. You can train dogs. You can put a tiger in a circus. I've even heard you can put a flea in a circus. I don't have any proof for that. But friend, hear me. You can't, there ain't much you can do with sheep because by the nature of a sheep, a sheep is naturally wayward. There's something inside of a sheep. It's just programmed in a way that he just, he's not intelligent on his own. Go, I know we all love to be lifted up and think we're the best and the greatest. But according to God's word, he likens us unto sheep. And he says sheep naturally lose their direction. You know, you can throw a cat in the woods and that cat will wind up on your front doorstep in three weeks sheep don't work like that they have to have somebody to come in they have to have somebody to direct them thank God for men that won't bow and bend and budge thank God for men that will still preach the truth of God's word and said I didn't come here just for a paycheck I didn't come here for name recognition thank God for a shepherd that can look at lions and say if you'll follow the path of God he'll bring you all the way home somebody say man we need shepherds in our life church we need someone that realizes by our nature we're wayward by our nature we like to wander by our nature as a sheep we can look at another sheep and say, well, you know, I think I'm producing a little bit more wool than that sheep. Therefore, I think I'm a little better than that sheep. And what the shepherd's trying to tell you is, yeah, you may be producing more wool, but you're about three miles out of the direction. Come on here. Come say, we need souls. And I say, thank God that the Lord has placed a shepherd in my life to deal with me where I am, to speak to me Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, and to say, Lord, is it I? Is there anything that I need? to change is there anything I need to let that man of God speak to me he knows naturally sheep are wayward he knows naturally sheep are weak how big are those fangs on those sheep anyway how sh- how sharp are those claws on that sheep anyway there's nothing there to protect them there's nothing there to keep them from that line they need a shepherd. Nowhere in God's word does it say try to make it on your own. Nowhere in God's word does it direct us that we're to be a one man army. A horse can kick. A mule can kick. A cat can scratch. A dog can bite. A skunk. That's my father-in-law after service what those skunks can do. He's had a little, he's had a little experience with them a time or two. <laughs> but what about a sheep? A sheep has no natural defense. Listen, the Lord knows that by nature sheep are wayward. The Lord knows that by nature sheep are weak. But the Lord also knows that the sheep are not just wayward and they're not just weak. They are worthy. There is a worth to sheep. The shepherd looks at the sheep and says, I know they're wayward. I know they have a tendency to go this way and that. I know that they're weak. I know that there's things that's out there that can kill and steal and destroy them. But there is still a worth to them. There is still a value to them. The real shepherd Shepherds value their sheep and thank God for a man that will value what God has placed before his hands and what God has put before his life. Say amen. We need to say thank the Lord and I am valuable in this church. If you're a part of this church, let me tell you, you're valuable. You may not lead the song service, but you're valuable. You may not take up the offering, but you're valuable. If you're a part of this church, you have a value. Shepherds know 
Yes, they're wayward. Yes, they're weak. But they're valuable. They're not likened unto a dog. They're not, they're not likened unto a bat. They're not likened unto a hog. They're not likened unto those unclean beasts. Those sheep are clean animals and they're representative of God's saints. And the Lord so loves those sheep and He puts men and women in their life to help direct them. He realizes there's a roaring lion seeking whom He may devour. There's a roaring lion seeking whom He can destroy. And thank God for a pastor and to say, listen to the word of of God and you will be safe. I want to get down and preach this for just a few moments this morning. I heard Brother Brian make his comment about long-winded preachers. Now listen, it, you, you got to understand. I mean, I go from I go from the extreme north to the extreme south. You start preaching too long around the Pennsylvania area, and man, I mean, you get over 25 minutes and they're squirming. You get down to South Alabama, if you don't go 45 minutes, they want their money back. So we'll try to get somewhere in the middle, all right? <laughs> you know, and I'm just with this pastor appreciation, might as well just throw this in. Have you ever noticed the longer the text, the shorter the message, the shorter the text, boom. They ever get up there and they go, I want to preach today on Jesus wept. You're like, man, we're going to be here a while. <laughs> Just a thought, just a thought. Friend, hear me this morning. Thank God for pastors that don't pastor simply out of public opinion polls. Thank God for pastors that will be an example and example unto the flock. I know there's preachers out there. I realize they're out there. And they basically say, okay, where, what sheep, what, which, which pasture do you want to go graze in? Everybody say, bye, if you're for this pasture or for that one over there. But thank God for somebody that says, this is what God's word says. Listen, 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 listen to what his job is. He is to guard them. He is to guide them. He is to grow them. And it takes a special man to endure for 24 years and says, God, I'm going to guard. I'm I'm going to guide and I'm going to grow. You know, in order to grow somebody else, you have to keep growing yourself. I was thinking this morning, picking on Brother Brian a little bit because he's, he's doing a great job. We were talking before service this morning. We said, you know, Brian, when you first, Brother Brian, when you first come in, compared to where you are now, wow. And of course, a lot of us was right after you got married, we said, thank God. <sighs> Yay and amen. <laughs> but the, that growth isn't automatic. There's been times Brother Brian's talked to me on the phone, and he's just, he's just kind of talking to me. He said, Brother, Brother Zane, do you realize there are times that Brother Hirsch has just taken me off to the side and said, have you considered this? Have you thought about that? And in the same thing that he said to you in public, he said to me in private, just the ability to let somebody walk into your life and help them grow. Friend, if you've grown in the Word of God, it wasn't just because you were such a self-starter. Somebody walked into your life and influenced you to study God's Word a little bit more. If you are deeper in the Word of God, today and you are 24 years ago you don't need to pat yourself on the back you need to say thank God that you have put an influence in my life somewhere or another to grow in the word of God look with me please at the role of a pastor the role of a pastor the elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder and the witnessing of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you and taking oversight thereof not by constraint but willingly not for filthy lucre but of a ready mind. He said they are elders which means not just elderly not just old but mature and growing in God. Thank God for somebody that says I want to grow in God. I want to study to show myself approved. I want to dig in God's word. I want to look at God's word. I want to expound on God's word. He's not just getting up here saying, hey, here's another topic that hit me of the week. He says, listen, this is God's word. Let's break it down. Let's dissect it. Let's put it back together again. That's how you grow in God. There again, I'm going to take you outside of the picture for just a moment to help you maybe get a better grasp on this. When I was a young preacher, I'm not exaggerating, when I was a young preacher, I had an older preacher. He was a well-known preacher. He told me, he pulls me off the side. I'm about 20 years old as a preacher. He said, now, Brother Estes, listen. 
I know you got a lot of ideas out there, but you know what you need to do? You need to get you about three months worth of messages and just preach those same three months of messages over and over to your congregation. Just give them a different title every time. And I thought to myself, how do they ever grow? And what do you do Monday through Saturday? Now, time out. There's times I've said, honey, whew, there's a new thought. And she says, no, you've, you've preached that before, believe me. I know not you. I'm just talking, that's just on me for a second, okay? Did you, honey, did you hear that illustration? No, you, you said that about seven years ago. <laughs> but if there's something you've got to notice about your pastor, and you've got to see it, because not everybody gets to do that. It's not just, well, here's John 3, 16, 52 times on Sunday throughout a year. Nothing wrong with that one scripture. But he's got an ability to pull from Old Testament. He's got an ability to pull from New Testament. He's got an ability to put you right back in the original setting and say, now this is what's happening then and there, but here's how we're going to apply it to our lives here and now. And sometimes people start taking that for granted and they don't realize not every church does that. Not every church is allowed. Not every church is able to do what we're doing this morning. It just doesn't work like that. It just doesn't turn out like that. Lots of times men just throw in the towel and they say, Lord, there's nothing new. I can't figure out. Thank God for men that are dead. Thank God for men that are dig. Thank God for men that open up the word of God and preach not what readers John just says, but what thus saith the Lord says. We need more of that. I remember Brother Ben Shaw, pastor there at the Fairland Holiness Church for how many years? He actually pastored twice. He went seven full years, looked at his wife openly. And he said, honey, I've preached seven years. There's nothing left in the Bible to preach to him. He resigned his church. By the grace of God, the Lord opened up a door. He went back. Pastor, there was another 25. <laughs> Thank God for men that will dig in God's word and feed his sheep and grow. Feed the flock. Know this, Paul says, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in, not sparing the flock. Peter warns of lions. Paul warns of wolves. And friend, can I just call a time out right here? And thank God there's a glare on that clock so I don't have a clue what time it is and neither do you. Say amen. And while, if you ever hear of the latest, greatest, gotta have them evangelists, every other church has got them and now we've got to have, if your pastor doesn't jump on that and doesn't book him for a four week revival, would you do me a favor and just don't kill the man because he may know something then you don't know God has given them the ability to see it from a different angle and he can realize when somebody tries to come in there and just fleece that flock and just try to get something off of them just take his wisdom and just realize God has ordained it for him to have that authority why didn't he get so and so I'm not saying that's a bad man but what if God put something in his heart and said no that's not the time for this church. A pastor has a way of seeing if he's really a true pastor. A pastor has a way of seeing when the enemy tries to come in and devour that flock. A pastor has a way of seeing when the enemy tries to come in and discourage that flock. A pastor has a way of seeing when the enemy tries to come in and divide that flock. Say amen, somebody. Oh, give us hearts again. How to say, Lord, thank you, Jesus, for somebody that you put inside of my life to guard me and to guide me and to grow me. That is the role of a pastor. Oh, and by the way, pastors, don't reproduce sheep. Sheep are a whole lot better at reproducing sheep. His job is to guard. His job is to guide. And his job is to grow. And yes, he should be an example in soul winning. But beloved, the ministries that we have today that come forth out of this church is because Somebody has been vested in you and now expects you to go out and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lost world. Well, that's a pastor's job. No, it's our job. The modern ministry mindset is church sits, you minister. The biblical mindset is church ministers, pastor equips. Church ministers, pastor equips. 
I'm telling you, 99, if we could just see ourselves out of the picture, 99% of most of our churches in North America have a mentality that says, I will sit, you will minister. Thank God for a church that still says, I want to grow in God. That the ministry that you've placed in me, I can do it better. I can do it more efficiently. I can do it more effectively. Thank you, Jesus, for men that will still guard and guide and grow their church. Say amen. He is to be a man of ministry. He is to be a man of maturity. That's the role of the pastor. What about the requirements of that pastor? The word of God tells us he is to have a right ministry and he is to have a right motive. The elders which are among you, am I also an elder with a witness the sufferings of Christ and I'm a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He must be a preacher of the word. No matter what else he does. I'm not against a story that's humorous or something. But if all you have is a preacher that tells jokes, you have a clown, not a Christ-centered man. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not against. I'm not against. There's times where it's appropriate. But I've seen it where it was a 45-minute laugh-in, and that's all it was. And God's Word never went forward. He must be a man of the Word of God. There must be times where God's word is ingested into our spirit and we dwell on it and we muse about it and we think about it. Feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof not by constraint but willingly not for filthy lucre but of a ready mind. He is to have a right ministry. He is to have a right motivation. He's not to preach begrudgingly. I just got back. I was teaching a two week class uh, Cram course at the Bible school there in Export. And I always love it when these, these young preachers want to come up and tell me where they're going to preach that next Sunday. And it's almost like, oh, man, I've got to go do that. Had one of them not too long tell me, said, oh, brother, I said, yeah, pray for me. I've got to go preach Sunday. And I smiled at one of them. I said, you're bad, but you ain't that bad. You don't got to. You get to. I mean, I, I know, I know, you can just, you can set their coattails on fire as soon as you walk in, but it's still a get-to, not a got-to. It's a privilege to preach the Word of God. You know, and the easiest thing for a pastor to do is start thinking, well, this is an ownership thing. It's my church and it's your requirement. Friend, it's the death of a pastor. If a pastor ever starts thinking that way, thank God for men that still say, I get to preach the Word of God. I get to sing the songs of Zion. It's, it's, it's a, yes, it's a duty, but it's not a begrudging duty. It's something I love. It's something I live for. I still remember the day, Brother Hearst, where as a young man, I signed my name to the bottom of a blank check, handed it to God and said anywhere anytime any place and I'm so glad that I did I don't regret being a preacher of the gospel it's always been easy negative there have been times you've been cut to the quick positive but I do not regret fulfilling what God asked me to do I don't regret that. Sometimes people want to hold a pastor at a higher standard than themselves. Help me, Holy Ghost. Ouch. I mean, it's kind of like here's clergy and here's laity. And there's this great gulf fixed in between them. And laity can get away with anything and clergy can't breathe. The New Testament concept simply isn't clergy and laity it's kind of clayity. <laughs> say amen. I heard him say before, Brother McKelvey. They said, well, that, you know that pastor, he left that church and went down the road to, to pastor another church. And the only reason he did it was for more money. You think that's wrong, brother? That's just, well, I think that's wrong. Sure, I think that's wrong. But let me ask you something, friend. When you leave the house of God to go find a job that gets $10,000 more a year, how come it's a sin when a minister does it and it's not a sin when the layman does it? Come on, the same blood of Jesus that got that man saved is the same blood of Jesus that's going to get you saved. And I'm telling you, as a church, we got to put our priorities right again and say Lord your kingdom first I mean pull up stakes go down, why'd you quit? why'd you move off to Ark, Arizona? well they paid me $35,000 a year more what's that make you? 
Say amen, somebody. Thank God for men that still do it because they love God's Word. Brother Estes, when you first got called to preach, Brother Hurst, when you first got called to preach, did you just did God just reveal to you you're going to be at least uh, one place at least 24 years? I mean, did you know in 2015, you remember what year it was you got called to preach? 79. That's for some of you discovered America. <laughs> Say amen, Sister Estes. <laughs> 1979, did God reveal everything? Thank God he didn't. We probably wouldn't have said yes. I've got to live through what? I'm going to have to endure what? I didn't know anything. He didn't know anything. But here's what it was. There was just a burning desire. There's just a burning, yearning desire. I couldn't have put it on paper. I couldn't have written you a dissertation. I couldn't have tried to explain it to you. All I know is you wake up with it. You go to sleep with it. You eat with it. And from 1979 to 2015, there's been some hard times. There's been some rough days. But here's what the Word of God said. The path of the justice is a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. And every day, God's just reminding me, I called you way back then, but I still got you in the palm of my hand through trials and hard times through storms you couldn't even see coming I have led you all the way I close I try to close he's to minister out of a loving heart the Bible said we're to give honor and double honor especially to those who labor in the word and doctrine in fact the doctrine that word honor is where we get our word honorarium from Thank God for men that say, Lord, your word first. And thank God for a church that says, God, we're going to take care of our man. I got good and quiet there. Thank God for a church that says, we're going to take care of them. We're going to make sure needs are met. That one church, you heard about that one church, said, God, we'll keep them poor if you keep them humble. Sad. (laughs) Thank God for a church that says, we want to bless our man. We want to make sure they're taken care of. We want to make sure they never lack. In fact, we want to bless them above and beyond. I'll go ahead and say it. I had a church just, just the other week. I don't worry. It's not applied here today. Okay, relax, church. But I got a letter. The pastor's coming up on his 20th anniversary. Here's what that church is going to do for him. They're going to give him $1,000 for every year that he's pastored there. $20,000. Somebody said, that's a heap of a lot of money. But one of the board members said back, yeah. And you know what it would have cost? If we had to replace pastors every two years, by the time you get them out and by the time you get them in, that's $5,000 in the hole, let alone the readjustment, let alone the shifting of the congregation, let alone the uncertainty. Dear mercy, I think that's a pretty good investment one man said to another come on here all I'm saying is you've been blessed at this church beloved you've been blessed at this church it ain't been every two years in and out it ain't been every year up and down there's been a steady course and it's been the mercy of God that's been upon our life to do it we're to take care of him we're to love him he's to love us And God's to receive the glory. I close. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now listen, in a very strict understanding of what Peter is referring to here in 1 Peter, he's referring strictly to pastors. There's a crown, and please don't, I'm not not trying to, Getting it all deep theology this morning, but there is a certain crown that's given to pastors. Now, I'm not saying you can't have a crown. I'm not saying the fact there's a soul winner's crown and one that endures joyfully. The Bible speaks of, a, but here there is a certain setting, and I can't. And please don't ask me to go into all the details. I don't have it figured out. But Peter reveals to us in God's wisdom, there's something special. A special place, a special recognition for those that do it willingly. Dolus Messer, he's a very intelligent student of God's Word, Brother Messer. He told me one time, he's probably in his mid 60s now. He said, Brother Estes, he said there was a young preacher that, or he said there was a preacher rather that was retiring and come to me. And he said, Yeah, he said, I pastored that church for 35 years. He said, I hated every day pastoring it. He said, but 
I was obedient. And now there's going to be a crown of glory waiting. Amen. Brother Messer said tears swelled up in his eyes. He said, oh, friend, by the words of your own mouth, you've judged yourself. Now, if you would not have done it, you would have been disobedient unto death. You would have been running from God's will. You would have been as guilty as Jonah. So you did it. I'm not saying there's not a place in heaven for you, but there's no crown for that. You didn't do it willfully. Willfully. Thank God for a pastor that willfully stands Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, late nights, early mornings, difficult times, preaching God's word. I close. In fact, Sister Estes, if you'll help me this morning, please. You're not to take that crown and strut it around heaven. None of us are with whatever we may receive of God. But couldn't you imagine that that pastor has a certain crown. I can't explain it. But he's able to cast that at the feet of Jesus. And very few men will be able to do that. Very few men will be able to take that crown and cast it at the feet of Jesus. There'll be those. I'm not saying I'm not saying they didn't make it to heaven. I'm not saying they didn't live lives. They looked. How come that crown's different from the rest of ours over here? Have you not read? Didn't you see what Peter told them? They did that willfully. Those were men that God put a special touch on for a specific task. And God allowed them to separate themselves from what quote-unquote ordinary life looks like. But He allowed them to step out of the picture so He can lovingly show sheep, you need to go this way. You need to go this way. That wasn't the man that stood with a cold gate smile and tried to see how many hundred dollar bills he can get out of your pocket. That's a man that loves you enough to tell you the truth. I mean, it'd be an awful doctor to look at you and say, now listen, even though you're sick like that, I just want to let you know it'll probably be a couple weeks and things will get better. Come to find out you got cancer. It'd be a terrible pilot. They'd say, where are we going to land? Just wherever you want to land. You just tell me where you want to land. No, I want to land in the right destination. Where are we going to land? Thank God for people that are still left. It'll be a shepherd. <coughs> and oh, brother, I believe you nailed it. I want to be as good a sheep as he's been a shepherd. I want God to deal with me. That if he does have to correct me, I don't throw my sucker in the dirt. If someone does have to walk into my life, and kind of say, listen, this, here it is. I want somebody to walk into my life. Have you ever walked in one of those services and you had the weight of the world on your shoulders and something was said on that Wednesday night and you walked away saying, oh God, how did he know that? I'm t- I can't explain this, but all I know is God places specific things in pastors' hearts that nobody else knows about. God reveals to them and He shows them. They feed that soul. Now you probably can't remember every title of every sermon in the last 24 years you've ever heard. You probably can't remember every time it rained for the past 24 years, but I can assure you, if it didn't, you'd have dead grass and wilted flowers. It's that steady rain. It's that steady word. It's that steady feeding. Maybe one of them stick out. Maybe one of them mean something to you because you were going through something specifically at that time. But it's that day in, day out of that ministry of the Word of God that's brought you here today. Thank God for shepherds. Thank God for men that will watch over our soul. I want to ask you this morning. I'm closing. I want to ask you this morning. Are you a part of this sheepfold? Do you really know that you're born again, son, sir? Do you really know that your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, ma'am? Now, if you're not, you need to be. And I can assure you, every sheep 
needs a fold to be a part of. And every fold needs a shepherd. So if you're here this morning and you're not a part of this sheepfold, you can be. And if you don't know nothing about this church, you don't know anybody here, let me tell you something, friend. You'll find a church that loves you. You'll find people that are warm toward you. You may just find somebody that, believe it or not, came from the same background that you did. Came from the same hurt you did. And if God can change their life, God can change yours. I want to do a little bit different this morning. I know most of the time, we come down to these altars and we pray. We take time and ask God to touch our needs, our needs, our needs, our needs. I wonder if just one Sunday out of the year, if it wouldn't be too much to ask our congregation right here, that when you come down to this altar this morning and pray, I want you to stop and think about the ministry that God's allowed into your life through over-shepherds who are under-shepherd of the great King. And I want you to take some time and just lift them up in prayer and pray for them. Sincerely pray God touch their life. And allow God to begin to speak to you of something that's changed you, something that's touched you, something that's motivated you, something that's maybe even corrected you. And maybe, just maybe, allow that to be the one thing you need that sometime throughout today, you get a chance you come to Him. Perhaps you text them. Perhaps you shake their hand. Perhaps you even hug their neck and say, I just want to thank you for making a difference in my life. Can we come all the way from the back to the front? Just right around these altars, can we just begin to pray for the ministry that God's allowed into our life? Come on, church. I know we normally pray for our needs. I I know there's a lot of needs in this house tonight. I know there's a lot of needs in this tabernacle tonight. Or this morning, rather. But let's begin to pray for another.